traveling. Have you ever been to Russia? Please raise your arms. Okay, many people. And have you ever been to Poland? Please raise your arms. Great. Have you ever been to any other Slavic speaking countries? Okay, even more people. Very nice. In how many countries can we hear and speak Slavic languages? Let's look at this map. So, as you can see, it's in Eastern, Central Europe, the Balkans, Russia, and I can count at least 20 countries here where, where you can hear and speak different Slavic languages. As you can see, according to this map, Slavic languages are divided into three large groups, which are the West languages, the East, and the South ones. Now, I was born in this small country called the Republic of Moldova, somewhere in the heart of Slavic-speaking languages area. As many people born in the Soviet Union, I am bilingual, and my mother tongues are Russian and Romanian. So Russian was my first Slavic language to speak. However, by now I've been living in Poland for six years. So today we're going to be focusing on some specific examples from two language groups, the West one represented by Polish and the East one represented by Russian. I could actually add one more language here today, which is Ukrainian. Do you know which language group? It belongs to the East one, of course, thank you, the East one. However, I can tell you that according to vocabulary, Ukrainian language is much more similar to Polish than to the Russian one, which means I can conclude that dividing languages into East, West and South groups have more to deal with territory, with the location, and probably with grammar rather than vocabulary. I could talk for hours about beautiful vocabulary similarities between Slavic languages, which all derive from Old Church Slavonic. But today we will focus on some specific particularities, and namely the ones that are useful while traveling to Slavic-speaking countries. How many people in the world speak Slavic languages. According to Encyclopedia Britannica, there are more than 315 million people speaking Slavic languages. But in which countries in the world Slavic languages are spoken as native ones? For this, let's look at this map, which clearly shows us the East Europe, Balkans, and the whole Russia, which also includes the Asian part. While traveling, do you sometimes use travel guides or workbooks? Good. And are they useful? Are they helpful? I can say at some point they are, but let me remind you that we here are polyglots, which means we want people from foreign countries to understand us correctly, don't we? That's why I propose you today to focus on Slavic inflections. And I will start with the definition. 
What is an inflection? An inflection is an inflectional change of morphem which changes the verbs person, number and aspect and the nouns gender, number and case. Usually doesn't it doesn't affect the meaning itself. Let's look at some specific examples. Now, if you cannot read the Cyrillic letters, let's start with the Polish phrase which you see on the right. Dokąd prowadzi droga? In Russian, it sounds like kuda wiedziot daroga. And you see the English translation below. As you might know, in Slavic languages, a is usually the ending of a feminine gender noun, which means daroga, droga, is a feminine noun. Let's look at the next phrase. If you'd like to ask how to find the road, you would have to change this word. Let's start with the Polish example. Jak znaleźć drogę? And in Russian it sounds like kak najci darogu. How to find the road, the way. As you can see, in Russian a changes into u, in Polish a changes into l. Let's look at another example and this will be masculine gender. So if you'd like to know where is the railway station in Polish, you would ask gdzie jest Wożyc and in Russian gdzie Vokzal. As you might know, in Slavic languages masculine gender numbers, nouns, and with a consonant, like for example this one. Let's look at the next phrase. If you'd like to know how to get to the railway station, then it's a little bit different. Let's start from the Polish again. Jak dojechać do dworca? In Russian it sounds as kak dojechać do vokzala. As you can see, we add a in both Russian and Polish to the noun in order to change it. And it was a masculine noun. Now it's, let's look at the example of neutral noun. Imagine you're in a bus or a train and you ask somebody to open the window. So in Polish you would say proszę otworzyć okno. In Russian it sounds like Atkroite Akno. You can add Pajalsta. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. I want one without one, please. Yeah. Yes, you can add Pajalsta, of course. The thing is in Russian you can avoid this word and in Polish you cannot make it shorter. That's why I couldn't think how actually, to actually, avoid. Uh, 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 yes? This is Russian there. You are right. <laughs> Thank you. So, as you can notice, neutral nouns usually have an O in the end, sometimes E, but we will be focusing on the O ending today. Let's look at the next phrase. So, if there is no window, you would say in Polish nie ma okna, in Russian it sounds like nie akna. So, as you can see, in both Russian and Polish, o goes into a. Now, let's try it yourself. Let's look at the first feminine gender noun again, and it was daroga, droga. Dokąd prowadzi droga? Jak znaleźć drogę? Kuda wiedziot daroga? Kak najci darogu? 
I'd just like to remind you that in Russian A goes into U and in Polish A goes into L. Let's do it yourself with another word which would be voda. Vada, water. So if you'd like to say water please, dajcie mnie wa D. Um, I, will, I will come back to your example why I say dajcie mnie wodu and in Polish proszę wodę. But I will also say what you did a bit later. So it could be a tricky example if we think about a bottle. Dajcie butylku wa di. Proszę butelkę wo di. So it can have an u in the end in both Russian and Polish. However, if you look at this word butelka, butylku, in the nominative case it's butelka, butylka. So as you can notice, it's also a feminine word, just like voda, pada. So it actually changes according to the rule. Butylka, butylku, butelka, butelkę. And you just change the last word whether you specify that it's in bottle or you generalize, just you ask generally for water. Let's try to do yourself the next example, which is masculine. So let's look it at it again. Gdzie jest dworzec here? Gdzie wokzał? Jak dojechać do dworca? Jak dojechać do wokzała? And we will take another word, which is dom, dom, house. How to get to the house? Как дойти до до дома? Як дойти до? But it's a tricky example. In Russian, you were right. But in Polish, як дойти до дому? I can tell you that actually in Polish, in most cases, such Words of masculine gender actually have an U ending and not A. So actually the word Dvořec, railway station, was an exception here. Now let's look at the wait, neutral. Wait, wait. Like, this is the exception, so Polish does do it like Russian? So yes, normally the Polish masculine word would change into an U and the Russian one into an A. Yeah, and what was the exception here then? When it, it ends in Polish, in an A as well, like dworca. Yeah. Dworzec, dworca, but dom, okay, okay, okay. domu. Okay, so only in feminine is, is that's the difference. Right. Okay. Right. Okay, so okay. in Russian it's always A, in Polish in most cases it's U, but sometimes it's also like Russian with an U. Thank you. And let's look at the neutral gender again together. So, proszę otworzyć okno, odkryjcie okno. Nie ma okna, nie okna. Let's look at the word kresla, a Russian word that means armchair and krzesło, a Polish word that means chair. A bit different. However, if there is no armchair or chair, how would you say it? Niet kres la. Nie ma kres wa. Okay, you did it well. Now let me tell you a story. But first, how many Russian speakers are here? Can you raise your arm? Great, no matter, just Russian speakers, thank you. And Polish speakers? What speakers? Great, Polish, Polish speakers, Russian Polish speakers. Mm -hmm. You will understand me. Imagine two Russian women in Poland. They're thinking 
they think that Polish language is so similar to Russian, so they would probably understand everything. A while later, they ask somebody about the road, and they hear this. Cały czas prosto. But what they do is they go and go for the whole hour, and they don't understand. Was it a joke? Now you understand me? Some Russian speakers, Polish speakers? Let's look at this phrase all together. Look at this. Cały czas prosto. So, actually, in Polish language, it means all the way straight forward. But in Russian language, cały czas, very similar to cały czas, means the whole hour. And prosto means simply. So, you simply go the whole hour. That's why the situation happened. <clears throat> now, in order to avoid misunderstanding, I propose you to discuss some more phrases like this today. I can tell you from my personal experience that both Russian and Polish people are very hospitable and if you go to their country they will probably invite you to their home, they will be nice, they will invite you to sit somewhere. Now it's very important to differentiate where you are invited to sit and what kind of cup of coffee you're invited to drink. So we're gonna be focusing on some more phrases and for this I prepared some printed materials for you and I'd like, I would ask to please distribute it now. Mm -hmm. So take one, <coughs> please. <coughs> there are some more phrases and we'll discuss all of them. The first phrase that you can see there is actually cały czas prosto. Cały czas, and you can see the Russian phrase Cały czas as well. Now here I marked some words with colors. What does it mean? So if you cannot read Cyrillic letters, please try to read the Polish ones and the words that have the same color are actually read in the same way. So, let's try it together. For example, you see this word, cały, cały, and is cały in Russian, very similar. And if you look at this, you see divan. So, this word is very similar divan. Mm -hmm. So these words are read in a very similar way, however they have different meaning. So both Russian and Polish people are hospitable and they would probably invite you to sit on the sofa. So here you have to be attentive because for Polish people if they say divan this actually means carpet. <laughs> and carpet in Russian will be kavior. However, if you say kavior in front of a Polish person you could think about Caviar. So, if you think, if you say kavior pod nogi, which means the carpet for your feet, this could be strange for a Polish speaking person. <laughs> what happened to the caviar? Why is it on the floor? <laughs> and in Russian, the word caviar means ikram. 
If you want to read the Russian words as well, please turn your page because I've prepared the Russian alphabet for you as well. And the Polish one too, with some specific notes about how to pronounce certain word, certain letter combinations. So please look at the letters, Russian, Polish letters, if you want to read everything. Okay. So let's look at this again. Sadisna divan, sadisna kavior, which in the first case would mean sit on the sofa, and in the second, sit on the carpet. And then we have kavior, podnogi, divan, podnogi, which means the carpet for your feet. Then I told you about caviar, ikra na stole, kavior na stole. And what about coffee? If a Russian person asks, would you like a cup of coffee? Chashka coffee. But for a Polish speaking person, chashka means actually something else. Kosti chashki, which are cranial bones. So this is something you would rather hear from a doctor if <laughs> some emergency happens to you in Poland. And let's look at the next group of phrases together. A friend of mine told me when she came to Poland and she didn't know some words in the beginning and she tried to tell somebody that she is keen on something and she used this and she heard okay we can make you a discount <laughs> because as you can see in Russian means to be keen on, but in Polish it means rozbierać się, to get undressed. And if you walk with a Polish person and he tells you zapomniałem drogę, this means he forgot the road. But if a Russian person tells you zapomnił drogę, this means he remembers the road well, so be attentive. Zapomnić darogu from Russian means to remember the road and zapomnić drogę in Polish means to forget the road. There is one more interesting, beautiful example I'd like to add here. Russian speakers, native Russian speakers, can you raise your arms? Okay, thank you. So you probably know it. In old Russian language, this, there was this word zapamätavat, which actually meant to forget. And in modern Polish uh, language, there is this word zapamiętać, which means to remember. So we can say to remember and to forget in Russian and Polish are uh, vice versa. Okay, so again, just for you to focus on this, in Russian zapomnieć, in, zapomnieć means to remember, in Polish zapomnieć means to forget, and in Polish zapamiętać means to remember, in Russian zapamiętać means to forget. But we know it's from Old Russian, so in Modern Russian we just say Zabit Darogu. Let's look at the next example. So if you want to get to the railway station or if you want to get to somewhere else, this is important. Where are you going to? To the railway station or to the palace? So in Russian Dvoretz is palace, but in Polish Dvořec is railway station. So be attentive about asking the road in Poland and Russia. 
Now let's look at the next group of phrases. So in Russian, if somebody tells you это академик, this probably means he wants to introduce you a person who will be an academician. In Polish, we can actually also say academic, but in Polish, if you hear academic, this would rather refer to a student's dormitory than a person. So I put here, uh, I put here Tvonek Akademi Nauk, which can also be understood as academic. And in Russian, the word for students' dormitory, Polish word academic, will be общежитие. Now, imagine you're in a conference with both Polish and Russian speakers, and this is very important for you when the conference takes place or when it begins. So, if a Russian person tells you Конференция будет утром, this means the conference will be held in the morning. But if a Polish person tells you Конференция będzie jutro, you see, утром, jutro, this means the conference will, will be held tomorrow. So it could be today in the morning and it could be tomorrow, which makes difference. Now, if you hear, if you hear from a Russian person the word rana, it actually means early. So, for example, еще очень рано, it's still too early. But a Polish person would understand it as morning. So, конференция będzie рано, this means the conference will be held in the morning. Okay, so again, let's focus on these phrases. Konferencja będzie rano. This is in Polish. In Russian, it sounds like konferencja będzie jutro. Konferencja będzie jutro. In Russian, it sounds like konferencja będzie zavtra. And jeszcze za wcześnie in Polish means it's too early. In Russian, it sounds like jeszcze oczyń rano. Of course, there are more of phrases like this. I just thought of some particular that would be useful while traveling, but you can find a lot of confusing phrases when it comes to Russian and Polish and, of course, the rest, the other Slavic languages. I hope it was interesting for you and thank you for your attention. And now it's time for questions and answers, of course. <laughs> yes, please. So you mentioned, you mentioned a lot of so-called false threats, but yes. can you tell us about the etymology? So why are there? Uh, do they come from the, uh, the same word or from this, from different word, but there's a coincidence, so why? So there are, uh, this, uh, that's a very interesting question, so first of all, thank you, yes. And you probably know there are different theories on this topic, mm -hmm. one of which is the understanding, so when the word first came into a Slavic language, different peoples understood it differently. So, yeah, let's say Polish people might have heard a word from another language and they understood it in their, their way, but in that language it meant something different. 
but also if we think about the provenance of these all languages, they all derive from Old Church Slavonic, so we can actually get another theory from here. It deals to, to the occurrence of the language, to the root of the language, so it, it can be so that some words had more similar meaning in the beginning of the, the language, when the languages started to develop, and now, you know, Slavic languages are lively languages, so they are still developing, and new words occur, and words change, and as you know, also speaking about old Russian, I really love this, that in old Russian we had such words still used in poetry, like ochi and cholo, and in Polish language, they still use ochi and uh, cholo. In Russian, it was cholo. Yeah. <laughs> However, in modern Russian, we say glaza and lob. So that's how the language is yeah. developing. Thank you. Yes? Can I, can I uh, to jump to this topic? And, yes, yes. Uh, so can you bring back one slide? Yes, sure. Which one? Because I think this word, Vojas, yes. uh, it's, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, because, yeah. uh, so it comes from Dvor, which is Yar. Yes. So they both, the, the railway station and the palace, they yeah. have something like a garden. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Mm -hmm. Yes, you're right. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Yeah. Innovations. So, yes, as you mentioned, some words derive from, from common different words, like for example here dvor, dvor it is yard, yes. And if you think dvorzec, the railway station, could have derived from that word and the Russian word dvorec for palace as well. That's right. Other questions, please, please. Actually, the same thing, so we could have found mm -hmm. off and it actually mm -hmm. did something like a uh, railway yard yeah. record. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I speak some German. <laughs> and this one. Thank you. Other questions? This? I've heard this, this may be more a question directed to. <laughs> Our friend than to you, but I I understand that Bulgarian has relatively few inflections. Uh, how how is how does that compare to the other Slavic languages? Oh, that's a very interesting question. I don't speak Bulgarian. I understand it well, mostly, and I've been to Bulgaria many times. So maybe we'd ask our colleague from Bulgaria to tell. Yeah, so, so Bulgarian uh, is actually has a very very a lot of common vocabulary with Russian. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it does not have inflection because uh, it developed in a different way. No, no inflections? Uh, few. Few, just a few. So uh, in Bulgarian. Uh, How in many? Bulgarian, so we have only one case. One. Which case? Uh, vocative. Ah. Vocative, okay. <laughs> the Russian only one with inflections is vocative. <laughs> the case, the noun case, but the verbs, the verbs we have uh, many, uh, many tenses. But they're, they're rather, uh, so we have inflections for uh, the verbs, not for the nouns. Mm -hmm. And it comes for, there is something that is called the Balkan Sprabund, and it is that the common languages on the Balkan Peninsula, they have common, uh, they have common uh, grammar. And that's why they are a bit different from the languages, from the same languages, uh, from the languages uh, in the same group. For example, Romanian, also is the grammar of Romanian is a bit different from the grammar of Spanish and Italian a bit because but that's a different Italian. language group yes yes but it is but Bulgarian and Romanian uh, Bulgarian and Romanian are both on the Balkan Peninsula and there are common features typical for the Balkan right. Peninsula that's why it used to be written with Cyrillic even although it's a Latin based language yeah yeah, yeah. but but, but uh, that's why the languages from different groups they uh, differentiate from the languages from their groups and have common uh, common grammar. That's interesting. Thank you.
thank you for your question and it was very interesting and speaking about cases because people here might wonder so actually in Russian we have how many cases? Wow. Five. Five. And uh, I mean the noun cases. Uh, it's a difficult question because uh, some, some linguists uh, Six cases. Okay. Uh, Six. Some yeah. say there are, there are more, for example, so-called uh, partitive. Mm -hmm. uh, when we called about this water, so for example, Andrei Zelizniak, uh, mm -hmm. he said uh, in the book, which is called Ruske uh, Minoslovenie, he said that another case, which is called partitive, Okay, but from what we learn in the Russian school, we have six cases when it comes to nouns. I'm just focusing on nouns now. In Polish, there are seven. So the seventh would be vocative. vocative. And now you say in Bulgarian, there is on the vocative. It's interesting. Yes? Um, yes, but it's the same as nominative. So, no. Yes, yes. I do. Okay, okay, okay. I agree with you. I agree with you. Right, right. That's the one remaining, but it's something else. When we're talking to God, so what they mean, Boja Moi, it's like, oh my God. Yeah. Because basically, if in nominative case we have mama, mother, we just say mama. That's vocative. And in Polish it would be mamo. So the R is changed into O. Uh, actually, in spoken language, we have a vocative with this mama. We can say just mom and, and that. Yes, the shortened form. Yeah, that, You're right. That, that's only yeah. in spoken language. but Only in spoken. That's right. Thank you. <laughs> okay, are there any more questions? Because we have some more time, I'm really happy we could initiate this lovely discussion and some more people participated and we've learned not only about Russian and Polish today, but also some Bulgarian, which I didn't know. Are there more questions? You can also ask me later if you remember something, of course. Hope to, to see you later. Yes, please. Just uh, maybe uh, from your personal experience learning uh, Russian as a, a Romanian speaker. Uh, okay, I'm a Russian speaker first of all. But as I told you, I'm bilingual. So, right, I have Russian and Romanian as my two mother tongues. However, my mom is Russian, my dad is Russian. I mean, they're Russian speakers. And Romanian is my mother tongue because I had a very good Romanian teacher. And I've been speaking it since very early childhood. So what I can tell about actually learning other languages, I've learned Polish mostly by myself and it didn't take me more than two months. So I passed B2 exam after learning for just two months. Yes, but how I did it? It's because I tried to read as many books in Polish as I could find. And that's an advice to you, just read books. I understood around 70% of information from the first book I read in Polish, then I understood like around 80 from the second book and, so on. and probably my fifth or sixth book would bring me around 90% of understanding and that, that's how it works. <laughs> Any other questions, please? Please? Uh, what would you say is the, uh, the most hardest thing for Russian speakers? When they want to understand Polish and they haven't studied any of any Polish. Like okay, so first of all, first of all, of course, the confusion that comes when it comes to false friends. First of all, this, of course, because when I first 
went to Poland and I didn't... Well, I've heard just several words before from my grandpa, but I, I couldn't understand much. And it seemed to me that I understand everything, which wasn't true. So, of course, the confusion about false friends. But then when it comes to grammar, it actually seems to a native Russian speaker that Polish grammar is just as Russian one, but it's not, of course. So focusing on the differences it's, is much more difficult than understanding like maybe 70-80% of spoken language even from the first day. Thank you. Would you, I'm sorry, yes? would you agree with the, um, with the point that um, Russian is sometimes sort of the old Slavic language in that, at least when you compare it to like, you also speak Ukrainian, right? Once again? Uh, do you speak Ukrainian or Romanian? Uh, Ukrainian just, just a little bit. Ah, okay, because um, it seems to me that um, Russian, if you compare it to like um, the other East Slavic and West Slavic languages, quite often um, you have cases where all the other these languages mm -hmm. uh, use the same roots yeah. and Russian uses something different. For example, the word for thank you would have that like, mm -hmm. or something like this and you use spasiba. Mm -hmm. I think there are... Well, the word spasiba like actually derives from spasi bog, yeah. that's the, dif the theory which means thank you, uh, which means say God. Mm. So, speaking of that's also a very good question, speaking of how modern Slavic languages relate to Old Church Slavonic, to the common Old language. I can say that at some point Polish is a lot closer than Russian to Old Church Slavonic, but on the other hand, at some point Russian is much closer. So it just depends what aspects of language are you focusing on. There are word cases, vocabulary. I can tell you one thing. Polish is the only Slavic language uh, which still has these nasal sounds L and O. And these sounds used to be in all church Slavonic. Thank you. If you have any more questions, please address me afterwards. We'll talk later, hopefully. Thank you all for attention.